Good evening, uh, uh, dear colleagues and friends from five continents. Um, it's uh, 6.30 uh, Central European time. Welcome to this online curriculum uh, to address unmet needs in prostate uh, cancer and uh, personalized managing, uh, management of a disease. Especially now, we focus on uh, patients with history of uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, a series of um, four live webinars, including case discussion, uh, Q&A, and, dis and uh, dis uh, discussion between uh, invited uh, key opinion leaders, uh, will be um, uh, presented to you tonight. So uh, the program is uh, actually developed by three um, uh, in uh, international organizations, the uh, European Association of Urology, in International uh, Cardiology Society, and the Canadian Urology Association. And the educational event is actually um, supported by a grant from Farin Pharmaceuticals. Now I would like to all the attendees from uh, 640 uh, um, registrations in 91 countries around the globe to send in questions. Uh, and um, please, you can start uh, after each individual lecture and also the live case presented later this afternoon. So I would like to invite uh, the three panelists uh, tonight. First of all, Phil Concord from uh, Liverpool in the United Kingdom, Associate Pref Professor in Urology, uh, followed by Professor Daryl Leong from the University of Ottawa in Canada, and finally, uh, Professor Lawrence Klotz from Toronto uh, in Canada as well. So by saying this, um, uh, we have um, two pre-recorded lectures uh, already sent out to each individual uh, joining this um, webinar tonight. And this will be followed by taking messages by the two first speakers. Uh, and then we have a live, a live case presented by uh, Dr. Lawrence Klotz. In between, we are going to discuss and have uh, multiple choice questions right, when you can actually uh, vote for, uh, for the uh, questions raised. And you will see them on, on the screen uh, later on tonight. So um, I invite now uh, Professor Phil Concord from Liverpool to give his first talk entitled The Comorbidity Burden in Prostate Cancer. So Phil, please welcome. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to summarize uh, the video you've probably already seen uh, looking at the comorbidity burden in prostate cancer. Uh, there's nothing new here. Uh, we're all very aware that uh, prostate cancer is a disease of elderly men and as you can see on this slide, elderly men have an increasing number of competing other disorders. As we get older, we tend to add to our collection rather than lose them. The other thing that's very important when we think about comorbidity is we tend to uh, underestimate the effect of distant disease and overestimate the effect of localized disease. In this graph here, you can see prostate cancer patients tend to live, if they don't die of their prostate cancer, they tend to live longer than the US male population. But if we split that out in the green graph on the right of your screen, you can see localized disease do much better, but people with distant disease do much worse. So when we're thinking about comorbidity, we need to think about how we might predict life expectancy. And of the many different ways of predicting life expectancy, gait speed is one of the ones that has most research around it. Here, you ask a patient to walk six meters and measure the speed, the time taken, and there's a direct correlation between the time taken and life expectancy across a range of ages that are relevant for our patients. And this might help you predict whether a man aged 75 has really got a 10 year life expectancy. The other thing to think about is for those people with multiple 
comorbidities. Remember, if you've got metastatic disease, our combination treatments that we currently use were for people with ECOG performance zero and one. And rarely do patients with poor performance do well with combination treatments for metastatic disease. The thing that I always remember is that if they can do their own shopping, then they're probably fit enough for combination treatment. And then we need to think about competing death rates. This is from a paper by Briganti, and it shows that only in young fit patients is prostate cancer likely to be the cause of death. And as patients get older, and certainly if they have more than one risk factor, they're more likely to die of competing disease than their prostate cancer. And this matters as, as we try and individualize treatment for patients. So what is the cause of death for these patients? Well, largely it's cardiovascular disease. About a third of patients die of prostate cancer itself, roughly a third die of cardiovascular disease, and then a third die of all the other causes put together. And so we need to think about the extra risk for these patients. Previous cardiovascular disease does increase your risk, but stroke increases it even more. You need to be very careful of patients with a previous stroke. And if you've got a combination of diseases, so in this slide, patients in the top line have no diabetes and no myocardial infarction. In the middle, those two lines which clearly cross either diabetes or a previous myocardial infarction. And the bottom is those patients who've had a previous myocardial infarction and also have ongoing diabetes. And we can see this combination is worse. So we need to think about risk factor modification. And for all patients, that simple things like stopping smoking, sorting out diet and weight, increasing physical activity and controlling blood pressure. And for those people who've had a previous myocardial infarction, they're likely to need a statin at a high dose and probably aspirin and some form of beta blocker or ACE inhibitor. And for people who have not had a previous myocardial infarction but are going to be started on androgen deprivation, we need to think about risk stratifying them. And then depending upon their risk stratification, they will need some form of additional therapy. In the UK, probably 80% of people are either intermediate or high risk on a calculator like the Framium Index or the Q risk, which is commonly used in the UK. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Phil, for these um, uh, um, uh, take-home messages um, highlighting the cardiovascular risk factors and age at the time of diagnosis, of course, make a difference. And the number of cardiovascular risk factors, of course, make a difference in terms of overall survival. And of course, cancer-specific survival versus um, cardiovascular mortality rates. But allow us to come back to that, Phil, in a minute, because I allow now uh, the second speaker to, to give his presentation before we get into uh, a number of questions and, uh, and uh, discussion. So um, I invite here by, um, Professor Daryl Leong from uh, the Medical Oncologist from Ottawa to discuss with us um, cardiovascular risk in prostate cancer patients um, undergoing hormonal uh, prostate cancer patients uh, uh, treatment. Sorry. So, Daryl, are you ready and jo to join us? So, these are really my three key take home messages uh, following on from the recorded presentation uh, that we gave uh, earlier, and hopefully, uh, you will have all seen. The first is that at least one out of every three men with prostate cancer 
are at high risk for future cardiovascular events. And this number of a third could well be increased to two thirds, depending on the threshold one wants to use to demarcate what constitutes high cardiovascular risk. Secondly, androgen deprivation therapy of any type is associated with an increase in cardiovascular risk factors. And as a consequence of this, we feel that it is very important for the urologist, the cancer specialist, the radiation oncologist to establish uh, communications and uh, uh, contact with their cardio-oncology colleagues, as this is a relatively new but rapidly growing branch of cardiology where we cater to the uh, cardiovascular needs of patients with cancers of various types. Until further evidence on what type of uh, referral criteria and what type of patient would benefit from seeing a cardio-oncologist, I think it's important to agree on referral criteria with your, uh, your specialist of choice because there are potentially a lot of men with prostate cancer who could be referred and who does get referred probably needs to depend not just on their risk, but on capacity as well. Now I have two further slides and they're not really intended as take home messages per se, rather they're intended to stimulate some discussion. The first is a slide which uh, contains data that may be discussed in another one of the uh, webinars that you have subscribed to. Uh, but what this data represent is a meta-analysis which is hot off the press and was only uh, accepted just in the last few weeks in the European Heart Journal Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy. In this paper, we undertook a systematic review and meta-analysis of trials comparing a GnRH antagonist, uh, Degarolix or Relugolix, with a GnRH agonist and we examined the association with adverse cardiovascular outcomes. And what you can see from this meta-analysis is that the GnRH antagonists were associated with about a 45% reduction in the risk of these adverse cardiovascular outcomes. Now for discussion, I think, is why this is not uh, part of the product monograph and uh, guideline-based recommendation with regards to prescription of androgen deprivation therapy. In the paper, we highlight some of the limitations of the existing randomized controlled trials, but I think this is an important point for further discussion and further research. The second uh, point I think for discussion is this, understanding that ADT will increase the risk of diabetes in many patients, uh, its management becomes highly relevant. And while metformin has traditionally been the agent, I think it's fair to say of choice in treating diabetes, especially in men on ADT, uh, because it's been shown to reduce adiposity and dysglycemia in this population. For the cardiologist, the SGLT2 inhibitors represent a new class of oral uh, uh, blood glucose lowering medications, which have had extraordinarily impressive results. So in non-cancer populations, including those with diabetes and higher cardiovascular risk, those with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and even individuals with um, mild to moderate impairment in renal function, these drugs have been shown to really reduce substantially the risk of adverse cardiovascular outcomes and remain a really important new uh, therapeutic tool that we have to reduce cardiovascular risk. And so on that note, uh, hopefully discussion provoking, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak with you today. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation to discuss a little bit about um not cardiovascular risk factors in detail. Um, we have seen um, some slides actually illustrating uh, drug treatment for prostate cancer that isn't contributing in, in increasing mortality from CVD, but uh, rather um, uh, increasing uh, uh, risk over time from a time of diagnosis, as I said earlier, and the number of uh, CVD um, that each individual patient is actually harboring. My first question, if, if we um, have... Um, now, Daryl and Phil with us, I would like to discuss with you um, a little bit of assessment tools in clinical practice. I mean, in the slides you shipped out beforehand, you discussed the Charlton uh, Index, but also framing and score, the and normograms as well. So the question is, in clinical practice, what you would prefer or to recommend for each individual urologist, oncologist actually to use uh, and what is more practical. So Phil, do you have any uh, response to my question? So in the UK, uh, a lot of these patients were assessed by their general practitioner, uh, to be honest. Uh, they will have an assessment every year using 
the uh, uh, Q-Risk that I showed at the end there, uh, which is based upon a Framingham uh, model, uh, and they will be able to give you a score. Uh, it's blood pressure, it is online, it isn't a complex uh, thing to calculate, and it will give you a predicted risk. Uh, so that or a Framingham index is easy enough to calculate online. Your specialist nurse will do it for you. If I may, I think it's a great question. Um, and the answer to it is likely, I think, to vary depending on one's circumstances. Um, in a setting where, you know, these risk factors can be evaluated in a cancer clinic, I think that's terrific and obviously ideal. Uh, we do have data, certainly in the Canadian context, that uh, say 25% or so of men with prostate cancer may have undiagnosed hypertension. And so clearly these individuals are falling through the cracks between their family physician uh, and the cancer clinic. Um, and this is through no fault of anybody's. It's simply uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, it's very difficult to keep on top of all aspects of an individual's health. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, a multidisciplinary approach is increasingly likely to be of value. Uh, and to try to determine which individuals are likely to benefit from a multidisciplinary approach, really simple questions could be asked, like, have you had a history of a heart attack or a stroke? Uh, have you got known diabetes? Um, are you a smoker? Responses, uh, positive responses to any of those questions may prompt, uh, you know, a, a consideration of a referral uh, to, uh, to somebody else with a vascular interest. Well, Daryl, um, the problem we have actually in our clinical practice as urologist or uh, any oncologist uh, out there uh, is time. So I think it's a good idea, as you alluded to, uh, to have a nurse actually raising all these questions and also the type of medication, whether or not the patient is on uh, antihypertensive uh, drugs or any other drugs um, after having a stroke, etc. So uh, I think uh, in a center uh, handling uh, cancer patients in, in general, especially prostate cancer patients, you need um, to ask each individual patient beforehand and an interview with a nurse or something in order to uh, to uh, get all the information to a practicing doctor. Uh, and then, of course, um, increase the awareness among all of us being urologists, oncologists beforehand uh, to really ask these uh, really important questions as you alluded to. So I, I think uh, using all these uh, um, Framingham score or normograms or Chosen indexes, it's not practical in our daily practice uh, before we, we lack time. I don't know how you see it. I mean, how many patients do you see being referred to you and there in Canada, for instance, from uh, oncologists or urologists? Um, I think that again varies widely depending on the resources that's available. At our institution, we're fortunate to have a fairly progressive cardio-oncology group and so we do have capacity and the clinical and research interest in seeing these patients. But I certainly know of, uh, let's say, more community-based practices where, it, to be quite frank, it's challenging uh, to, you know, to identify people to take care of uh, their patients' cardiovascular health. How about in Liverpool, in the UK, uh, Phil? Um, do you have time enough to ask, raise all these questions? No. Uh, so uh, they're largely screened. So, because it's not just this, it's not just their cardiovascular event. What about their bone health? We're going to put them on uh, androgen deprivation. They need bone monitoring as well. And so we have a selection of things that will need to be monitored beyond just this. And that largely, that we will write to their general practitioner. Now, if they are clearly very high risk, so they've had a previous MI or a previous stroke, then they might go for assessment directly. But as we've heard, there are lots of people out there who have a risk of developing one of these things, and that can't be uh, screened out by the urologist. And at the moment, we are writing to their general practitioner and saying, these people will have an increased risk, please do an assessment, and then refer if you think they're high risk. Now you could argue, that they should refer them even if they're intermediate risk. But largely what's happening is the general practitioner is managing the intermediate risk patients and only the high risk patients are then going on to see a, a 
hospital specialist. I think uh, the problem we have actually in, in uh, Scandinavian countries is we don't have enough uh, cardiologists uh, to refer to. Uh, it's lack of speci specialists actually there. So I think there's a difference when, when the comparison is made with uh, Canada, for instance. But uh, in general, of course, uh, if there uh, are a number of risk factors, we should and uh, be better send them to uh, a cardiologist as you are in Ottawa. Um, the question is, um, when it comes to you, um, Lawrence, in, in, uh, in, in Toronto, whether you uh, send a lot of patients of yours um, uh, to a cardiologist in your city. Do we have Lawrence with us? Uh, I think he's on mute. Okay, Lawrence. Thanks, Per Anders. The short answer is not many, but I think to me, like I enjoyed these two talks a lot, and I think the key message is that in, in a patient, the typical prostate cancer patient. Apologies. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So I think the the key point is awareness that as a urologist, you're seeing these patients. Number one, they have comorbidity that might not have not been adequately dealt with. And number two, we're talking about uh, the focus, of course, is on ADT of this session. You're putting them on, on a therapy that has cardiovascular effects. So I think, you know, you have a, a mandate to either deal with them or refer appropriately. You know, I deal with them myself, a lot of them. I put patients on statins, on uh, a biguanide le like metformin, track their blood pressure. It's to me part of putting patients on ADT, bone health. Uh, this will come up during the, during the case. Uh, so I'm not sure they need to be referred in large numbers. Certainly the ones who have real, pro, real significant comorbidity, uh, but you need to deal with the other aspects of this uh, if you don't refer them. Well, uh, it, it's, um, as you said, unmet needs here because we, there is a lack of awareness, as you alluded to, um, uh, Lawrence, among the uro urologists, especially, I think, also oncologists, uh, at least in Europe. Um, but uh, cardiovascular diseases make a difference in terms of overall survival and, and uh, survival in general in these patients with um, prostate cancer, especially advanced cases. So I think uh, this... Um, webinar tonight is actually um, meant to highlight the importance to really pay more attention and focus on uh, CBD uh, in prostate cancer patients in general. Uh, I think there is an unmet need here, as I said before. So if, um, I, could just, yep. if I could just add one other comment. Um, neither of the speakers talked about smoking cessation, probably because it's such a no-brainer, but uh, the reality is a lot of these patients smoke and particularly in countries where it's prevalent. And the most cost-effective and beneficial thing you can do in all of medicine is counsel a patient about smoking cessation. And there's data that the patient who's newly diagnosed with prostate cancer is very, or with cancer in general, is very susceptible to the message. So, and, and there's also uh, data that the, the more prevalent smoking is in a country, the less likely the doctor is to talk to the patient about it. So I think I know it's a very international group that's listening. I'd really encourage those colleagues who, who work in countries where smoking is highly prevalent to incorporate this into your patient management because you really can make a difference. I think it's uh, obvious to us uh, in academic centers, but uh, for many people out there, we, we still need to um, um, uh, increase the awareness of smoking being a bad habit. So that's quite obvious for most of us, I, I guess. But as you said, uh, we, we need to actually mention smoking and to quit smoking in our patients, sure. So any more comments from Daryl or Phil, please go ahead. I just think we need, you'll need to be able to rank them. So in uh, where Daryl is, you're fine because there is capacity, most of us, uh, there is one cardiologist interested in uh, oncology, cardiology in uh, Liverpool for about 1.2 million people. Uh, and therefore, we have to be very selective about who we send them to. Uh, and, but it is really important to highlight it to their physician that this is going to be a problem and we're going to make it worse.
Well, Phil, uh, if I look at the UK, um, uh, in overall, you have 66, 5 million people, right? And you have less than 800 urologists, uh, what I'm aware of. So I, I guess you don't have uh, the time needed to uh, actually take care of cardiovascular diseases on the top of prostate cancer. Is that correct? not one of the options. No, I guess not. So um, I think, do you have any more questions? I haven't seen any more questions coming in from uh, the registrations or attendees tonight. Um, so I do like, see uh, several questions on the Q&A. You do. I don't see them here, but you can raise one of the questions, Darren, if you look at them. I just okay, so about, maybe I could... Uh, while you're looking them up, could any of you comment about low-dose aspirin and where that's at today? Because I see, still see many, many patients with no previous risk factors who are on low-dose aspirin. Yeah. Uh, great question, Laurie. Um, we actually recently discussed this uh, internally and has been discussed at length amongst cardiologists uh, worldwide. My take on the aspirin story in individuals who do not have established cardiovascular disease is that it might, be, it might lead to about a 10 to 12% reduction in the risk of myocardial infarction and probably stroke as well, ischemic stroke. But that is balanced against an increased risk of bleeding and obviously especially gastric bleeding from ulceration. And as a result, the effect on mortality, the risk of death, is kind of neutral. So there's still, it's still vexed about uh, who should be on aspirin if they haven't had a history of myocardial infarction or stroke. Um, and you'll really get two arguments. Uh, one school falls into the, uh, the, the feeling that especially in individuals at elevated cardiovascular risk, the benefits may exceed the risk of doing this. But is aspirin should be put into the water or given to every, uh, every individual? I don't think the answer to that is true. Uh, I think that, you know, if we're going to be using it for primary cardiovascular prevention, it should be used selectively. Well, it's interesting because, uh, and once again, coming back to my uh, countries and the neighbor countries uh, in Scandinavia, uh, more than 50% of all, all people up here uh, above 70 years of age, they are on uh, different kinds of aspirins, actually without any history of cardiovascular diseases is interesting. Um, um, physicians actually prescribe it, uh, um, especially family physicians in our countries. I guess it's somewhat different in other parts of Europe, but uh, here they are really eager to prescribe it. But you said there- And I should add- uh, Family patients- Perhaps I could just add that uh, uh, I have, more, more of my patients are very enthusiastic about taking aspirin despite its modest effects. And I get much more resistance to taking a statin, despite the fact that it is much more effective at preventing myocardial infarction. So it's just uh, an interesting um, messaging and probably um, uh, social media is as much to blame for this mismessaging as anything, I think. Yeah, you're totally right there. I mean, statins um, should, is probably not prescribed that uh, frequently as aspirin, so at least my part of the world actually. So I think it's uh, resistance to prescribe statins, the fact that, uh, the fact that you, the patient has a CBD uh, history. So um, I will, I will, rather than uh, these questions, do we have any more comments before we move on to a live case presented by Lauren Klotz? Any more comments, Phil? Uh, there's something here from uh, one of the participants, Claire Bruff says, has the Q-risk score uh, actually been studied uh, in the cancer population? Uh, as far as I'm aware, that's not true, not specifically. Uh, it has been uh, studied in a non-cancer population, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not uh, specific for cancer patients. But if I ask uh, uh, the three of you, if you look at the different, um, uh, um, now uh, once again, coming back to Framingham frame scores and normograms or Charleston index, what do you use or what do you uh, tell the um, registr registrants here? Uh, and attendees of this, meeting, of this session. Uh, what is the preferred choice of um, assessment tool? Phil, can you, what's your preferred assessment tool? Uh, so uh, largely the NHS uses the QRIS score, uh, which is an adaption of the Framingham anyway. It's based on the same things as the Framingham. Uh, so that's, that's what GPs are used to using. Uh, and patients over the age of 70 should have an annual assessment every year by their GP uh, as part of a health check. So it's 
difficult to ask them to use something different if you're going to send if you're going to delegate this back out to general practice and we know that they're using QRISC anyway QRISC is what we're going to use uh, because that's what GPs are useful and they've probably got that data already on their system and yeah. so when you say if you think they're high risk then they need to be referred on they probably already know that. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's the same uh, in many European countries actually. So Daryl in Canada what do you prefer to use? Um, I think the Framingham score is probably the most widely used. It's uh, available as an app. It's available readily online. So fairly straightforward. And in terms of actionable items from it, I think, uh, you know, I try to keep things fairly simple. Uh, if somebody is, according to any of these tools, at high risk, um, mm -hmm. then I would suggest that they should be on a statin, irrespective of whether they've had an ischemic event in the past or not. Um, and I would target a systolic blood pressure definitely less than 140 and likely if they're at high risk, less than 130. Uh, and so if you just stick to those two fairly simple principles, I think that would go a long way to mitigating a lot of the uh, cardiovascular risk in the population. Okay, that's, I think we have answered that question. Um, the question is now, I think uh, we are um, on time. So uh, Lawrence, are you ready to present your live case? That illustrates very much what we have been discussing so far in terms of cardiovascular risk factors and prostate cancer and uh, refer to this number of trials as well and multiple choice questions. So, Lawrence, please go ahead. Okay, so this has really been an interesting series of presentations. It's great to reconnect with friends and colleagues. And uh, we've all been, I think, massively affected by COVID and it seemed for a while like nothing else mattered. But of course, patients get other diseases. I, in, I think many areas, those have been neglected during the period of COVID. There's certainly some of that in my environment, reduced hospital resources and visits and so on. Uh, so I think we need to make no apologies for talking about uh, a common condition like prostate cancer, which affects uh, so many people. And uh, the, this multidisciplinary approach, I think, is really warranted. So. This is a, a real case which I think raises a lot of issues that come up and there's some interactive questions here which are really just to get a sense of what the variation in practice is. So uh, it's a 72 year old engineer who, uh, whose family doctor was of the constituency that did not subscribe to the value of PSA uh, in, and he developed progressive voiding symptoms with frequency and decreased stream, started on tamsulosin, then developed back pain. Now he had the PSA, which was 267. And he had a biopsy that showed grade group four, Gleason eight in 10 of 12 cores with a cribriform uh, pattern. And he had a bone scan, which showed uh, five distinct metastases not at all surprising given the level of the PSA and the high grade. So uh, he has a relevant past history. Both parents died of heart disease in their 70s. He was a longstanding smoker, stopped a year ago, rarely exercises. He's been stented two vessels for coronary artery disease about two years ago. He's obese, moderately obese with a BMI of 32. He's had a 10 year history of hypertension and he has diabetes controlled with metformin. So he's, you know, uh, we see patients like this all the time, very, very prevalent. Uh, the obesity is prevalent, the uh, other diseases also. So he had a bone scan and I just would like to now go to the interactive question. Would you order more imaging studies? CT, multiparametric MRI, PSMA PET, another test, or given the fact that he's got five metastases, do you really need to do anything further? So if we can vote now, and I believe we're getting the, uh, there we go, there's the question. And uh, I'm not sure that there's one correct answer here. It's really, uh, this is an area where there's definitely a range of practice. So, so um, Lawrence, if you um, allude to this, um, these uh, options here, if you look around the world, there are not all countries actually having access to PSMA PET. Yeah, so correct. So 
I, let's just uh, so you can see I, uh, the the responses, and there's there's uh, some consistency. So CT, which I would do, I think uh, the presence of adenopathy or visceral metastasis is worth knowing, and this patient is certainly at risk for that, and it would change your management. MT MRI, if it's of the prostate, personally, I don't think there's much value of that, but 16% of people would do it, unless that refers to a whole body MRI, which has been uh, suggested to, uh, to, to be very sensitive for metastasis, but not widely used and not that widely available. Uh, PSMA PET, yeah, so in, in my world, we can only get PSMA PET for recurrence. We cannot get it for de novo uh, uh, untreated prostate cancer like this patient. And, uh, you know, the issue here is it may very well show more disease in the bone scan, but is that going to change his management? And that's a, that's a discussion which maybe we can get back into in the, in the discussion period. And I think nothing further is not unreasonable. He's got bone metastasis. You're going to treat him. So let's keep going. Uh, just one slide showing, and I think this is now widely known, but just to show one piece of recent data that clearly the, in the uh, patient who is newly diagnosed, we're not talking here about CRPC or non-metastatic uh, uh, castrate-resistant disease. In the patient who's newly diagnosed, the yield of PSMA PET for metastasis is really extremely high. Sensitivity uh, 0.97 compared to 0.86 for bone scan. So somewhere around 15% uh, greater sensitivity. Uh, MRI is kind of somewhere in between and specificity of 100%, which actually I don't think is true. Uh, there are definitely false positive PSMAs, uh, tuberculosis, uh, uh, some neural tumors like schwannomas can be positive, uh, uh, Paget's disease and so on. But it's clearly a, a superior test in terms of sensitivity. At the bottom you see per lesion sensitivity. So just to emphasize that point. So then the patient goes on ADT and will vote again for this. So there's a lot of options here. And uh, it'd be interesting, uh, I thought, just to see the range. So do you put him, he's got, he's got bone meds, uh, kind of borderline low to high risk in terms of the number. Do you go with an agonist? Do you go with agonist and a month of uh, antiandrogen? Do you continue the antiandrogen combined androgen blockade? You use an antagonist given his comorbidity and maybe other advantages. Do you ever combine an antagonist with an antiandrogen? Uh, do you, are you one of those people who starts with the antagonist to avoid the flare and then switches over to the agonist, surgical castration or others? So you can go ahead and vote. Now there clearly may be a role for additional uh, a rats in this patient, but really this is the question about the initial ADT. So if people could vote. I'm always interested in the variation rather than what actually the correct answer is. And my guess is there's gonna be a lot of variation for this one. So, yeah, so, um, Looks like the commonest is agonist plus antiandrogen for a month. Uh, I'm personally an advocate of continued uh, combined androgen blockade. There is uh, there is some benefit to this, probably about about 15 to 20 percent with bicalutamide. One randomized study from Japan plus several modeling studies, but it's not that widely used. Uh, an antagonist is quite is uh, really. 29%, quite substantial. Uh, very few combine it with an antiandrogen. Uh, we got 3%, uh, we got, sorry, 11% surgical castration. So that, that to me is quite high. It's almost non-existent, I would say, in the North American environment, but clearly in uh, developing world, it's still quite common. And 10% use the antagonist followed by an agonist and, um, you know, that's in a, in a sense, it's a rational strategy, but I don't think it's very widely utilized. Uh, 
Uh, most people, for whatever reason, don't like to switch. Uh, we'll just keep going here. So the patient started on Degarelix for Magon and comes back for a second opinion two weeks later. So now this is the question of, uh, in the modern era, ADT is not enough. We all know that. So what do you do with this patient? Again, 72, moderate cardiovascular comorbidity. Do you put them on docetaxel, uh, six cycles, apalutamide or enzalutamide, abiraterone, radium, just the ADT? And it's kind of a separate question, but do you still subscribe to intermittent ADT if he has a complete PSA response? So go ahead and vote. Um, We, we didn't really get into the issue of the antagonist versus agonist in cardiovascular health. Uh, so here's the response, quite a range. A third would go with docetaxel, 29% apalutamide, 22% abiraterone. I, I assume the preference here is that given the, the patient has a history of hypertension, diabetes, uh, this is the kind of patient who one would tend to go with the uh, apalutamide, enzalutamide, rather than the abiraterone prednisone, and I think that's that's reasonable. 11% uh, continue ADT alone, and still some advocates of intermittent therapy, which I'm glad to see. I'm one of those. Uh, uh, so let's just... Uh, summary here of the various couplets and it is bewildering. Uh, there are so many options. ADT plus doci plus abi enza apa daralutamide is coming. Uh, daralutamide looks like an appealing drug with somewhat less toxicity but we don't have any uh, data yet in the it's all in the uh, non-metastatic uh, or at least most of it in the non-metastatic CRPC setting. Uh, and the questions are remaining. Uh, is there a mandate? So this patient has a fairly small volume of metastatic disease. Uh, is ADT still a standard of care for these patients or is there a mandate to put them on combined therapy? I would say where the drug is available uh, that uh, I think in, in the parts of the world where it's funded uh, patients, by and large, with metastatic disease get combined therapy with an ARAT, even if they have small volume of metastatic disease. Of course, the data suggests that, um, at, at least with the ARAT, uh, certainly with chemotherapy, it's the, it's the smaller volume patient who tends to benefit. If couplet therapy is the new standard of care, uh, what factors should affect treatment selection? This has to do with disease burden, as I mentioned. Uh, is it de novo versus recurrent uh, comorbidity? So I, I, I think the major impact of comorbidity has to do with the prednisone component of the abiraterone. Uh, of course, the prednisone can be given at quite a low dose of five milligrams. Most guidelines recommend that a patient who has relatively severe diabetes or hypertension, avoid that. I think for the majority of patients, it's quite a safe approach to put them on abiraterone, low-dose prednisone, even with their comorbidity. And then timing, we really don't know much about. And just one comment here that uh, all of the studies that we're so familiar with, the one positive study after another, Latitude, Arches, Enzymet, Titan, charted, almost none of them were early versus delayed with full crossover. And therefore, these studies leave open the question of timing of treatment. It's really still unclear how much benefit there is to early therapy. The only study that uh, really had comprehensive crossover on progression was the, um, uh, the French study of, of docetaxel. Uh, uh, Jetag 15, 
which showed no difference. Can we come back to this right now um, before you move on to the next slide? Yeah. Um, Lawrence, when, when it comes to the French study you alluded to, I mean, they looked mainly at um, uh, heavy metastatic burden. And uh, here we are talking about quite heavy disease if you look at the bone scan, but especially sure. um, high grade uh, Gleason grade. I mean, and so it's a high risk prostate cancer patients. But to start up in most European countries with Dosatexil or Abbey uh, ENSA at this stage, before you find out the, the outcome of a hormonal treatment. Right. Is that a little bit too early um, before you have the outcome of uh, combination therapy, in other words, LHRX or antagonist plus um, um, antiandrogen? Well, I, listen, I think we all, I think most people believe that these drugs uh, prolong survival and should be used when the patient develops metastatic disease. Um, the, and, and I would say, uh, to be honest with you, if the drugs were relatively inexpensive, I would really promote everyone going on them when they were diagnosed with metastatic disease because really the, the uh, toxicity is quite minimal. Uh, because they are, they are so expensive, at least so far, um, I think you know, it, it's something to consider to hold off for a while just to reduce the impact either on the patient's finances or on the healthcare system finances. Uh, uh, you know, some of these patients respond very well to ADT and may be stable for a prolonged period. So I'm talking here about this, the low volume patient only. So with, you know, just uh, either nodal disease or just a, a, a few uh, bone metastases, this patient's kind of borderline with five minutes. As you raised also, Lawrence, I mean, quite many of these new, rather new drugs like every and, uh, and salutamide, but also especially apalutamide. Uh, many countries uh, around the globe, they don't have access to these drugs and they are quite expensive still. Yeah. Uh, Dosotaxel is less expensive, of course, and most countries, they do have access to it. But it's also av availability of uh, medical oncologists to, to treat this patient. Um, well, in, in Europe, is of course, Ger Germany, where, where all the urologists are taking care of these uh, drugs and uh, treat our patients. But just to clarify, uh, I think uh, urologists with an interest in this area are fully capable of administering the AREX. Yeah. You're talking with the medical oncologist, you're really talking about chemotherapy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, any comments from Phil or uh, before we move yeah. on? Yeah, if I, if I could, just to, uh, just to be slightly more controversial uh, and pro doing something early, if we take the data from Stampede, which uh, clearly, as a UK urologist, I've got a vested interest in, but we look at the effect of giving treatment for metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, and there is a 17 month improvement in overall survival. And if we look at the same study and we look at the advantage of giving it for castrate resistant prostate cancer, there's between a four and a six month improvement in overall survival. So you could argue that the data suggests that early treatment is better than waiting for them to progress. And so I think if you are fit enough to have treatment, and there's always a bit of a risk assessing that, and it is available, I think you should have it. Despite the fact that it's free to patients in the NHS, only 27% of people in the UK National Prostate Cancer Audit who could potentially have uh, docetaxel actually did have docetaxel. So it clearly doesn't happen to everyone and lots of people are not having treatment. But the, there is quite reasonable evidence that uh, you get a bigger effect if you give it early. Well, but just to, just to be clear, it's a bit of an inference. It's not, there is no early versus delayed trial. No, no, no. And so, when you look at chartered and in the Stampede study, relatively few patients went on to have docetaxel afterwards. Right. So when you look at the, so even in the high risk group, only about a third of them went on to have docetaxel afterwards. They might have had other 
treatment which was effective, but they didn't all get docetaxel afterwards. And clearly they were all suitable for docetaxel at randomization. Yeah. Uh, so there is a risk, uh, but uh, it is inference rather than uh, a randomized study, but clearly uh, it's the quality of the data that we have at the moment. Yeah, I, you know, I'm kind of uh, parsimonious by nature. And the fact that these drugs, at least in my environment, are something like $5,000 a month, I would like to have really high quality evidence that, the, that starting them early rather than waiting until, for, until uh, uh, the patient has a larger burden of disease uh, is, is clearly a benefit. But, I, but I, I don't disagree with your basic point. They clearly are a benefit to the patient. It, it, it's somewhat of a cost benefit perspective that I'm expressing. Well, to sum up is what you're saying here, um, with um, reference to this slide, it's obvious that you're a little bit more aggressive than most European uh, urologists actually to introduce um, uh, cuplet uh, treatment for these uh, COVID patients at an early stage. But as you said earlier, we need a more randomized trial to look at early versus late. So please move on to the next slide, uh, Lawrence. Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, a couple other points I want to make. So one of the questions that uh, is still, I think, um, in, the, in the air is the question of intermittent therapy. And, uh, you know, there's now about 10 prospective randomized trials that all show either that it's not inferior SWOG 9346 was inconclusive. So there's, there's not a single trial, although there's a debate about SWOG 9346, but there's not a single trial that clearly showed that you needed to keep the patient on lifelong hormonal therapy. And I think this is still an issue, even in the era of the ARATs and uh, chemotherapy for hormone sensitive disease, because you can imagine the patient gets six months of chemo plus ADT for his newly diagnosed uh, hormone sensitive metastatic disease. And he has a complete PSA response. Why not give him a trial of intermittent therapy? And this is, in my view, this is partly driven by uh, this data, which is now almost 15 years old, but this comes from the SWOG trial that stratified patient survival according to their PSA response to ADT at seven months. And it is, it is so powerful. So the difference between a complete PSA response in the green less than 0.2 is a median survival of about seven years versus failure to nadir below four after seven months is a median survival of one year. So, and, and very few of the studies that are in the literature of intermittent therapy selected out the patients for a complete biochemical response. But it's very plausible to me that you take these patients who are complete responders, uh, discontinue therapy. Some of them have a very long off-treatment interval. And given that there's all these studies showing that it's not inferior in terms of survival, uh, I think it's worth a try. If their PSA pops up right away, then uh, you put them back on hormones and likely no harm is done but in many of them, they'll have a prolonged off-treatment interval with significant quality of life benefits. Uh, so now uh, in this patient, the PSA has dropped to two and you're considering treating the primary. So again, he's got five METs, he's on ADT. He's had a pretty good response. Do you give radiation? Are you of the school that believes in radical prostatectomy and metastatic disease, cryo, something else, or nothing further? So if you can go ahead and vote now. There's clearly been a resurgence of interest in radical treatment for metastatic disease. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how our attendees vote. Andrews, I missed the background music while people are voting. That was a stable of meetings. I can turn on Eva if you want to. Yeah, that would be, I'd, I'd appreciate that. So 50 56% with radiation, which I personally, I, I think that makes the most sense. Also, this patient has significant comorbidity. And 20% for radical prostatectomy. Uh, 
you know, it, it's there's definitely a school of thought that supports that. Uh, my own view is that the benefit in a patient like this is going to be likely to be very small. And I think a quarter roughly would just go with the ADT. We have, we have good data, which I'm not going to present, but this comes from Stampede that uh, radiation does have some benefits in these patients. So I think in the patient with small volume metastatic disease, there's clearly been a shift to giving them radiation as well. And here it is actually. So uh, this is uh, patients with M1 disease, over a thousand uh, patients in each group and 40% with a low metastatic burden, 54% with a high metastatic burden, pardon me. Uh, so overall, this uh, was a negative study. Uh, although there was a benefit in terms of time to progression in the uh, radiotherapy arm, but where it got interesting uh, is that when you stratified and it was a, uh, a pre hoc stratification. So this was a planned analysis uh, by disease burden, uh, look at that benefit in terms of time to progression and overall survival favoring uh, radiation. So I, I would say the standard of care here has shifted that in men who have a low burden of disease, there's different ways of defining that, but somewhere up to around between less than four to six uh, metastasis, depending on which standard one uses, there's clear benefit to adding radiation. And then this is my final slide. I just want to summarize. So a lot of these issues were brought up by the other speakers, but this is called the ABCDEF of, for men on ADT. And I would say the take home message is that when you use these drugs, you are uh, putting the patient at risk for a number of unwanted effects, which can be dealt with and managed but you in a way need to act as the primary care physician for that patient. So awareness, we heard a little bit about ASA. I think if the patient has any risk factors this, for cardiovascular disease, this makes sense, but I don't do it if there is no prior cardiovascular disease as Daryl mentioned. In my view, the, the increased risk of the ADT alone is not enough to put them on ASA routinely, although some people might disagree with that. Bone health, uh, this is a whole story that we're not focusing on today, but there are several randomized trials. I did one of them that one pill a week of Alendronator Fosamax actually increases bone mineral density about 2% after one year. Whereas if they're, on nothing, if they're only on vitamin D and calcium, they lose 2%, which puts them at risk for fragility fracture. So this is an area where I think we could do better as a community. This is not widely uh, uh, ascribed to. I mentioned cigarette smoking in the question period and statins. And I think we heard that there's a real benefit to statins in these patients. I, I, I put every single patient going on ADT on a low dose stat, usually um, uh, uh, Lipitor between 10 and 20 milligrams. Then the D is for diet, diabetes and dementia. So uh, Dr. Leung mentioned the metformin and the, now the new SGLT2 inhibitors. There are two randomized trials showing that metformin in men on ADT reduces weight gain, uh, waist circumference, insulin and glucose levels, does not cause any side effects in the vast majority, doesn't cause hypoglycemia. And I think there's a lot to be said for this. Uh, and again, it's not widely used at all. Exercise, if it were a pill, we would all do it. You can reduce the loss of muscle mass and reduce the sarcopenia and they feel better. And finally, the Firmagon story for men with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, and probably everyone's heard there's now an oral antagonist that is probably gonna be on the market fairly soon. And both the Firmagon studies and the uh, Relagolic study showed a trend towards reduced cardiovascular events in men with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So uh, this is not yet carved in stone, but I think the signals are, are very uh, compelling that there is some benefit in these patients, probably largely due to the uh, stimulatory, stimulatory effects of the agonists on um, endothelial plaque inflammatory cells. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Lawrence. I, I hope I am online now, and um, so you can. I cannot see the. You are. Oh, thank you. So um, I think we we are running out of time, but some short questions uh, should be uh, probably uh, should be uh, casted here. When you talk about, I mean, what you refer to in terms of metformin, we have a lot of data published in the literature re related to prostate cancer. But then, as you allude to also, Leon. Uh, Daryl has some uh, new information regarding uh, the other drug now used in, in diabetic patients. Can you refer a little bit to that, uh, Daryl, if you are online now, you should be, the new drug? Um, with... Yes, um, I am online, thank you uh, for the question. Um, look, metformin has been around for such a long time that really uh, in the broader population, the evidence that reduces cardiovascular, major cardiovascular events is actually lacking. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't. It may well do so. It's just that it never has, uh, has been well demonstrated in a, in a clinical trial. Now we have these SGLT2 inhibitors, we have a dilemma because we all recognize the potential for metformin's beneficial effects. But these newer agents have conclusively been shown, whether with metformin or independently of metformin, to actually reduce cardiovascular death, hospitalizations, myocardial infarctions, et cetera. And so the dilemma is, you know, if you had to choose one, which would you choose? Um, it's a tough decision. Um, at the end of the day, we fortunately don't have to make that decision often because uh, many patients with, uh, on ADT or with diabetes will actually require two blood glucose lower, lowering drugs. And if that's the case, both of these would be my agents of choice. Uh, but occasionally you do have to choose one. Uh, and I have to say, given the data that's emerged in the general cardiology population, that the SGLT2 inhibitors tends to be uh, my preference uh, at this point. Thank you very much uh, for to be, make this um, yeah, very clear for us. Statins, you alluded to a little bit uh, about statins. You start already when you initiate uh, ADT, Lawrence. Is that correct in all patients? If they're not on it already, I encourage them to go on it. I mean, we have no uh, randomized trials of statins in ADT. So the, the evidence is inferential, but there are now there's two uh, retrospective studies both mm -hmm. show exactly the same thing that a men in ADT, uh, aside from the cardiovascular benefit, there's a prolonged time to uh, antigen independent progression. And it's probably because statins compete with some of the androgen substrates uh, that require a transporter to, to enter the cell. So for example, DHEA needs a transporter called SLC, SLCO2, uh, and that is the same transporter that statins use to get competitive uh, inhibition. And therefore, it may, uh, it looks like it prolongs the time to androgen independent progression, which is really what we're all trying to, trying to achieve. So uh, to me, it's just got everything going for it. I use it routinely. Oh, great. Um, the other thing you, you also mentioned a little bit about is uh, to use antagonists rather than uh, agonists. And uh, there are, as you indicate also, since we've been using um, Thermagon since uh, 12 years as a monthly depot, but also more recently published in New England Journal of Medicine last year, um, the paper on oral antagonists. So do you use these drugs uh, on a regular basis, uh, uh, Lawrence? Yeah, so uh, this is a controversy and we probably don't have time to drill down into it. Uh, the, the oral drug is not available yet, hasn't been approved in Canada, so it's just on the horizon. But I think it will have an impact aside from the fact that it's a pill versus a needle. The, the cardiovascular story, I would say, is still a controversy. There's uh, all kinds of preclinical data and some clinical data that uh, suggests that there is a protective benefit in patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So if I, I, I like to give patients the choice because it is a one month versus a three, four, six month depot. But if they have a significant cardiovascular disease, I tend to try and get them to go on the, the degarelic rather than the, than the agonist. Well, the only problem I see with this HERO trial published in New England Journal of Medicine is, of course, uh, oral administration and uh, compliance. Absolutely. So, a little bit of I mean, issue. I think, I think, yeah, it's, listen, it's, we've got one study and we've got no clinical experience and uh, there's all kinds of issues. Does If the patient misses a dose, does he get a transient rise in testosterone, and is that, is that a problem? Uh, and it may be a problem in some patients, uh, 
So yes, there's a lot of uh, questions about that. It's not a no-brainer. Well, another controversy, Lawrence, as you mentioned a little bit, is intermittent therapy. Obviously, you are a little bit more pro than most of us in Europe, uh, based on this controversy since the 1990s, and we are still discussing. Yeah, I know. Therapy. But in this patient, especially, do you think there's a role for intermittent therapy? So, so I think where there's an undisputed role is biochemical failure. These patients have 10 to 15 year prostate cancer survival. There's huge benefit. In metastatic disease, you have to be much more selective. Uh, the average patient is not a candidate, but mm -hmm. there are some who are. So there are some patients who have just a phenom who are phenomenally antigen sensitive, and and that often is durable over many years. The long term survivors, and I think uh, it's worth a trial of discontinuing therapy. And uh, if they don't. If they bounce back right away, you put them back on, and I don't think there's any harm done. But some of them will spend years off treatment, and they tend to, I think, have an improved quality of life. Well, I don't think we have more time available. Otherwise, we could easily discuss a lot about novel therapies like Ensign, Aberaturon, Avalutamide, etc. But I think we have to do it uh, in the next webinar, so we're going to launch uh, late April or in May. So saying this, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the panelists, uh, Phil Concord from uh, Liverpool and uh, Daryl Leon from Ottawa. And finally, you Lawrence from uh, Toronto and Canada. So by saying this, I uh, also would like to say thank you very much to uh, all uh, co-workers I have in the EAU central office. I used to work with uh, Secretary General for eight years, a uh, really professional. So um, moving uh, forward, uh, I would also uh, say thank you very much to our sponsor, pharmaceutical um, uh, uh, company, uh, Faring Pharmaceutical, and um, also um, all the attendees coming from, as I said in the beginning, uh, 91 countries. It's really fantastic. And 600, more than 640 attendees tonight. So um, I welcome you to the next webinar, actually in, uh, uh, during the springtime, and that is a webinar on how to manage uh, CBD risk in prostate cancer patients during COVID-19. I think that's uh, very relevant as we are still struggling with um, uh, pandemic uh, uh, problem across uh, the world. So once again, thank you very much for attention tonight, and uh, see you later during the springtime. Thank you. Great to see you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.